Good afternoon. Welcome to the second part of the webinar series on Acquisition 102B. Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and we are so pleased to be able to partner with our colleagues in the ODOT Office of Real Estate to bring you this training in a virtual format during this time of a stay-at-home order. We have on the training for you today Wayne Pace and Sean Crawford, and they will be your presenters. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Oh, a few of you told me hello already in the question pod. Thank you. I was going to let you know that we do um, accept questions throughout the presentation today, and I would ask that you please just drop me a hi or hello or even a good afternoon in the question pod so I know that you found it and that um, we're good to use that method to accept your questions. Um, the other thing is that we have handouts for you in the handout pod. They are the slide deck for today and also an index of handouts that will be referred to during the course. So those are the two items I had. Uh, Wayne, are you ready? I'm ready. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. This is our last day for the webinar, Acquisition 102B. And so with this last session, we're going to get into a couple of things here. <clears throat> we'll be hitting the highlights of the um, release of lien, of encumbrances, talking about the uh, mortgage releases, um, a little bit about the real estate acquisition and utilities, just one aspect of it, because there's multiple facets you can really get into, but we're just going to talk about one part of it. Uh, negotiating with a third party, uh, representing the owner, minors and incompetence, conflict of interest, and the estates. Okay, looking at the releases of uh, releases of lien and encumbrances. When the district office acquires real property from an owner, it must uh, purchase the purchase the property free and clear of liens and encumbrances. And then we look at what the definition that gives for the liens and encumbrances, basically, or monetary claims against the property. Uh, to secure an obligation of debt uh, to the owner. Various types of liens that they have out there, um, mechanics lien uh, from a contractor, uh, liens for unpaid taxes, mortgages, land contracts, uh, court judgments. Those are the some of the liens that they have out there that you would see when we're dealing with um, this acquisition phase. Where do we find these liens and encumbrances? Which is very important. This is the reason why it's very important to know the types of forms that these things would come on because it would come on the title report. Uh, the title report, of course, describes all liens and encumbrance of record against the property to be acquired for the highway project. The process to verify these encumbrances and these liens is that the negotiator will verify the accuracy of the information of the title report. So in other words, the negotiator basically will go through during its face-to-face -face meeting, or to, in this case, it's a virtual meeting, um, to verify the accuracy of the information that's on the liens. Um, and the encumbrances of the title report. The negotiator needs to verify if there are any liens or encumbrances not mentioned on the title report. That way, um, they can go ahead and write those that information down, and that will be a part of the record. The negotiator will need assurances that the owner is willing to secure releases. Typically, what we do is for releases, it's the RE240 series that we have on hand. It's in our um, real estate website, on our real estate webpage that we have for the mortgage releases or the releases period. If an owner of the property cannot obtain a release, we want to find out why. What's causing the problem? Um, is it the mortgage company or does the um, property owner is not willing to 
provide us what we need to go ahead and work with the release. We also have provisions that you'll see a little bit later on down the road that we try to provide assistance to the property owners. But if we cannot, we want to find out the reason why. And in the event that we cannot get a reason or we're having some problems um, getting the partial or some type of release, then we're going to seek that advice from the Ohio Attorney General's office um, because there's a possibility that we might have to appropriate that particular parcel. Um, <clears throat> on ODOT's uh, real estate webpage, these are the, um, the category of releases that we use um, that you'll see on our website. One of the most common ones that we use is the um, mortgage release, the post mortgage release that uh, is on our website. Here is the partial mortgage release uh, form that is used. And of course, everything that you see that's highlighted in gray is the items that would be used in um, completing this particular form. All right. So now we're going to go to the mortgage releases. This is out of our 5202.06 section of the real estate manual. Except in those instances where mortgage releases are not required pursuant to section B of this procedure, mortgage releases are required for any property right acquired by ODOT that is encumbered with a mortgage. We're gonna talk about that ex um, exception in that section B too. If ODOT is um, acquiring a total take, then quite naturally what we're going to be looking for is going to be a complete general satisfaction of mortgage because we're going to be acquiring that entire piece of property. So I'll just take a quick overview of it. When only part of a property is acquired, a partial mortgage release is required or is needed. When a mortgage release cannot be secured from an owner, the parcel must be appropriated. In general, the mortgages, they contain some of the following languages, imminent domain clause and acceleration clause, requiring the proceeds to be applied to the unpaid balance to the mortgage holder. And if these proceeds of if these proceeds of funds are not applied to the unpaid balance, the mortgage holder may declare an unpaid balance due and payable. Now, looking at the exception B procedures, this is probably one of the most um, I can't say controversial, but the one that had most of the movement over a period of years uh, until we reach uh, this particular. Um, particular procedures. Now, a mortgage release is not required when FNVE has been established at an amount that is $25,000 or less. Now, get to a little bit of a caveat here. When, of course, the mortgage is $25,000 or less, uh, with exception. Now, out of our um, Ohio Revised Code 5301.16 controls of removable, removal of fixtures of improvements. So if we have an improvement that is in the take area, then we're going to have to go ahead and get a partial mortgage release. And here is a citation by law which is under the 5301.61. Okay, now when dealing with temporary, temporaries involve temporary construction easements. Um, typically, a uh, release is not necessary, with the exception. If we're going to cause some type of negative effect to the residue, what do we mean by negative effect to the residue? 
we're going to remove a, a house or some type of a structure that is in the temporary area. And so quite naturally, we're going to need some type of a, a release for that because we are going to take that structure. Every mortgage release must be recorded and the release and the released and will be a part of the acquisition file. If the district elects not to secure the release, the negotiator needs to inform the property owner. Um, of course, when they must, the property owner is going to have to review their loan and dot mortgage documents, uh, contact the lender. Uh, of course, it's going to be their responsibility and obligation with the part of that for to let the know be acquired for public use. Now, on our notice of intent to acquire a good faith offer, it's going to be referenced under the good faith offer page. Here is our NIAGFO, uh, the first page of the NIAGFO. And here is the good faith offer portion, which is the second part. And the area that's highlighted in blue and that we've now um, highlighted in yellow is the area that talks about what the property owner will need to do in the event that ODOT is not going to seek for a um, partial mortgage release. And basically, just let the property owner know is that it's going to be their responsibility to contacting the mortgage company with regards to letting them know that ODOT is going to be acquiring the property or part of the property for public use. And that's basically what that is actually saying. General steps of securing a, a mortgage release. Okay, you wanna acquire this as soon, start this process as soon as possible. It takes a long period of time to be able to acquire one of these and the various hoops you have to go through. So the negotiator needs to verify the existence of any mortgage. The negotiator or the owner may contact the lender. Negotiators should offer to uh, use RE100, which is known as the authorization to obtain a partial mortgage release. Now what this form does, it kind of, uh, releases the burden of the property owner trying to get the partial mortgage release. And the reason why is because a lot of times property owners do not have the time nor the patience. And sometimes the mortgage companies will ask for more information than what the property owner can provide. So we provide this, ODOT provides this convenience to the property owner. Mortgage holders will request uh, for the parcel information they want to see the appraisal or the valuation. A title report, a legal description in an instrument or the contract. The right-of-way plans, make sure that the right-of-way plan is colored in. A lot of the mortgage companies do not have the ability to look at civil engineering right-of-way plans and to them, all, they look like a bunch of lines that are on a piece of paper. So we wanna make sure that we are providing the mortgage um, lender a copy of what you're receiving is showing the takes, showing the property lines and showing um, existing right-of-way. All of these things are very important and all, all those areas need to be colored in and it makes it a lot easier to reference your discussion with that mortgage company. Now, there is a processing fee, not all mortgages have it, but there are some mortgages, a lot of mortgages, especially now, probably the majority of the mortgages do have processing fees uh, that were required um, for getting a partial mortgage release. This is covered under 49 CFR uh, 24.106 under the incidental expenses. Now, there are times that some fees can be pretty excessive. Um, that's where you need to be bringing your manager in to see about working through that process uh, on the excessive fees. There is a possibility you might have to bring in the attorney general's office 
to work with those excessive fees. Also as well, communicate with the person, a signature authority that's going to be signing those mortgage release, those partial mortgage releases. Um, of course, the last choice, if the mortgage um, processing fee is too high, you have that ability to appropriate the parcel. This here is what is known as the RE100, which is known as the authorization to obtain a partial mortgage release. All the areas is highlighted in yellow uh, is what is the example that the information would show, showing the name and the address of the property owner, uh, the name of the lending institution account, even if you have a first mortgage or if you have a second mortgage. Um, and then the signature of the person that of the property owner that we would actually need and then we would uh, submit that information to the mortgage lender at the, of the one that we're working with without this particular form the mortgage lenders will not talk with us because we do not uh, do not have anything to do with this mortgage so by getting the property owner's permission uh, this would help us work with the mortgage company Now, on the partial uh, mortgage release, of course, it gives the name and the lender of the institute, um, the amounts of the lender that will be paid, that's coming from the FMVE. And then, of course, is listing the names of the grantor and the date signed and the data was recorded. And then the project identifier, the auditor parcels number, and then also, in this case, we would insert the RE247 corporate acknowledgement form. And if you remember, we talked about corporate the acknowledgement forms under the C version of the contract version. And in this case, you would notice on this says the RE247I. That I means as an instrument that would come from an instrument, so the mortgage would be recorded. Okay, now I want to show this little chart to you because there's two situations here. Sometimes uh, the mortgage company will require proceeds from the FMVE, and that's what you see the square that is located that is on the left side is that amount will go in that particular area for what the mortgage company will require out of that FMVE. It could be a part of it, the part of the mortgage, part of the FMVE, or it could be all of the FMVE. You don't know that until the mortgage company would be able to tell you. There are situations, rare situations, where the mortgage company will not require uh, any FMVE. If that's the case, then we have uh, language which basically be put in there as a gift donation pursuant to 5501.33 would then be inserted to that area where the amount is located. All right, do we have any questions up to this point, Victoria? We're going to go into our next section. No questions up to this point. Okay, we're moving on. The next area we're going to get into is going to be the real estate acquisition and utility connections. We're just going to touch on this on the surface basis um, because in the event that if our utility section puts on a class, I'm sure it'll be a very in-depth um, class that they would put on and give a lot of great examples. Uh, but in this case here, real estate issues will happen with utilities being impacted outside of the right-of-way. Acquisition um, may serve uh, utility reconnections and dwellings. The reconnection may not be a part of the construction project. The FMVE value estimate uh, will need to be con uh, considered for the re uh, reconnection cost. 
if unusual situations arise in the plans, the negotiator and the appraiser and the project manager needs to identify those issues and talk about what's going to take place. A lot of people are involved with that. Um, you have your district utility coordinators, which basically are out in all of the districts. And of course, you have the utility section of central office real estate. Utilities involve all of the items that you see there, your water, your electric, your gas, your telephone, all the communication lines, sewer lines. Typical situations for uh, the negotiator. <clears throat> uh, this should be handled in the appraisal, of course, and will be a part of the FMVE if the appraiser is aware of the activity. And that is the key component, if the appraiser is aware of the activity. Most common scenarios is the district office would be notified by the construction that a service pole will be relocated or has been relocated, and the negotiator would need to contact the property owner to reconnect the uh, electrical service to the pole. Typically, this is a private riser that would be uh, impacted. And what we'll need to do, what you would need to do as a negotiator is to, uh, you'll be handling the RE64, the special waiver agreement process of damages to be able to compensate um, to get that uh, service reinstalled back onto that pole. Discussion of special waiver damages, we typically handle those. Um, in our Acquisition 103 class. All right. Negotiating um, with a property owner representing um, an owner, with a party representing an owner. Negotiating with a party representing an owner. This is out of the 5202.09 section of the manual. An owner may uh, nominate another to present them in negotiations. Before the negotiator deals with an owner representative, the negotiator must do the following. Request um, the owner to provide written notice, identifying the owner's representative as the nominee in negotiations. Every now and then, you will have uh, someone that wants to uh, a family member or a neighbor or a good friend to handle the negotiations for them. You need something in writing that says that John Doe will be representing me uh, on the negotiations of my property or the acquisition of my property. That way you have something in writing that shows that you are able to talk to this other person. If the representative is an attorney, Then a letter stating the same would be sufficient. And then the negotiator should verify the letter that's by that uh, the attorney with the property owner. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because there are times that if you have a large project and um, letters will go out to property owners, sometimes we may get a copy. You want to be sure that that property owner is being properly represented by the attorney. And, um, to verify that information. All right, Victoria, we're going into our knowledge check. Okay, I'm going to get the first set of poll questions, or first poll question put up. Um, you know what, actually, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slide, because I this one was really long. Okay. okay, I haven't seen it yet. I got it up. Did you see it yet? No, I haven't. I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. There must be back. a slight delay there. I you still see knowledge back. check number one. Okay. Tell you what, I'll just launch the poll. And uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind reading the question because it sure. was really long. Okay. Here we go. Question number one. When dealing with the complicated parcels, such as apartment complexes, condominiums, and shopping centers, districts may need to seek guidance from the Assistant Attorney General's office. True or false? 
quite a number of people have voted already. So we're almost at 80%, which is great. And they definitely have been paying attention. I'm That's gonna good. close the result, the it out and share the results. And I do see your question up now. They all voted true, 100%. Okay, here goes the answer. There we go. All right, let me put the next one up. And someone said they're having some problems voting. Don't worry about it if you can't. Um, you know, that's not a concern that you have to actually vote. We're just doing this as to make it more interactive and keep people engaged. Right. When the district acquires real property from an owner, it must purchase the property free and clear of all liens and encumbrances. True or false? They're voting quickly on this one too, Wayne. Okay. Oh, we had an interesting shift in the answers. Okay, we're almost 80%. I'm gonna close it out and then share the results. Okay, 90% said true and 10% said false. Okay. Hiding the responses. Answer is true. Okay. Next question. Right. I'm sharing it. What form identifies all liens and encumbrances of record a property? Against the property. Against the property. Sorry about that. I must have mistyped. We've That's got okay. the RFL form, NIAGFO, introduction letter, and title report. They are all voting. Okay. There we go. We're over 80%. I'm going to share the results. 3% said RFL form, 3% said NIAGFO. Um, and 95% said title report. So apparently it doesn't add up to 100% there. <laughs> we had 101% effort on that one. So I'm going to hide the answer. Here. All, right. All right. I think we might need you to um, stop sharing and reshare your screen. Oh, there we go. We can see it now. Sorry about that. Okay. And the answer was title report. Okay. Okay. So our next question. If the owner of a property cannot obtain a release of mortgage, what should be done? Seek advice from the AGO, seek advice from Chief Legal, seek advice from Central Office. They're voting quickly on this one too. We'll see if this one adds up to more than 100% when we're done. That was interesting. Somebody wants to know, is there extra credit for the 101% participation? <laughs> We'll see what we can work out. I'm just glad everybody's so engaged on this webinar. This has been a great series. And these recordings are going to be a phenomenal reference for the future. All right. It looks like voting We're, went fast and furious there. So we have 85% seek advice from the AGO, 3% said from Chief Legal, and 12% said from Central Office. So I'll hide that. Okay. A is the selection. Next question. Okay. When only part of a property is being acquired, a blank release may be required. What is the name of that release? Partial mortgage, full satisfaction, release of a lien, all of the above. Okay, we're over 80%. I'm gonna share the results. 85 said partial mortgage, 3% said release of a lien, 12% said all of the above. And the answer was? Partial mortgage release. All right. <clears throat> and our next one, when FMVE has been established at 25,000 or less, 
with no improvements in the take area, is a mortgage release required? Yes or no? Just remember, we don't record your answers, so go with your gut on these. All right, we're over 80% voting. I'm going to share the responses. 5% said yes, 95% said no. So I've okay. hidden the responses. Okay, moving on the, to the next one. And the answer was, I didn't see it come up yet on my screen. Oh, that's okay. Did it, is it still delayed or did you come up with a I, new one? I see the next question now. It just never showed me the answer. Oh, you mean go oh. back? The answer Wait, was no. Or you, the answer was no, okay. Just want to make sure that we caught it. Maybe it's just my computer. It's acting slow today. Okay. So what happens if there is no resolution with the mortgage company regarding excessive processing fees? Do you pay the additional amount of money, hold out and let the parcel sit, appropriate the parcel, or none of the above? And we do have a question on that last question, so. Okay. We can address that once we've finished this one. We're over 80%. We had 6% said pay the additional amount of money, 86% said appropriate the parcel, and 9% said none of the above. So I'll okay. hide those responses. And the answer was appropriate, appropriate parcel. the parcel. Yep. Okay, okay. what was your question? It says, for the last test question on 25,000 or less, does improvement mean structure or building or any improvement? It could be any improvement, including the structure or building, but any type of improvement that is fixed to the property, uh, that's gonna be a part of the take. Okay, that was all the questions I had in the question box. Okay. And then I believe that brought us to the end of this section of poll questions. Yes. All right, moving on to our next section, minors and incompetence. This is located out of our 5202.10 section of the real estate manual. <clears throat> when it is apparent the owner is either a minor or incompetent, you need to contact the AGO, the Assistant Attorney General for uh, guidance and direction. costs will be uh, taken care of as an incidental expense so that way it would be covered but when you come into those situations uh, we need to notify the attorney general immediately with that all right moving on conflict of interest this is out of the 5202.11 section uh, this is out of the modelable sections here, out of 49 CFR 24.102N, and out of the Ohio Revised Ohio Administrative Code 5501-2-506B14. Uh, the appraiser, a review appraiser, or persons performing the valuation, uh, perform the waiver valuation, uh, shall not have any interest or direct or indirect in the real property being valued for the agency. Number two, the appraiser, review appraiser, or preparer of the value value analysis <clears throat> for a parcel may be authorized by the agency to act as a negotiator for that parcel being acquired so long as as, uh, as long as the offer is $10,000 or less. Here's the criteria. The FNVE is $10,000 or less. Uh, if authorized, the appraiser, review appraiser, or the VA preparer may act as a negotiator. And this applies to the establishment only of the FNVE, not the administrative settlement. Now, <clears throat> with that, some departments or some agencies like doing that some do not they feel they feel it's too close but a lot of times uh, some um, 
I would say some districts, not departments, but some districts like to exercise that practice because it moves that they get them closer to understanding the valuation and better to explain the valuation to the property owner. And then that way the property owner has a clearer understanding of the appraisal valuation or the valuation, waiver valuation, how it was prepared, what they look for, um, things of that nature, bring it a little bit more closer to home. So that all depends on the district management. Uh, if they want you to do that, how comfortable you are of, of the explanation to the property owner, but that provision is there for that. Okay, government employees with an interest in the property impacted by a project. This is out of 23 CFR part one, section 1.33 and out of Ohio revised code 2921.42A1. Officials or employees who have an interest in the property impacted by the project and who are in a decision-making position must disclose this fact and recuse themselves from any involvement in the project and sign a conflict of interest form. Employees who have an interest but are not in a decision-making position must disclose this fact and sign a conflict of interest form. Two different levels. So the first level basically it involves an employee, but also an official, someone with a decision-making capacity over that's in charge over various programs or department. That basically, if that project hits their particular property, then they're going to have to recuse themselves, which means remove themselves from project involvement, notifying the department and assign a dis um, a um, conflict of interest form. Whereas an employee that does not have decision-making capabilities, but just lives there on the piece of property that's going to be impacted by an ODOT project, basically just needs to notify the department and then just sign a, a, a conflict of interest form. Okay, so here is the blank conflict of interest form. Basically, it's where it's just inserting the name of the employee, inserting the um, if division or for central office or if it's a district office, disclosing the type of interest that they have in the property, uh, inserting the project identifier, and of course the signature and date of the employee, and then the signature, in this case, district real estate administrator or central office um, administrator. And then here is a clear sample of what, what it would look like by being fully executed. All right, <clears throat> coming up to the last section of the form, a lot of this portion of the form is completely um, AG driven. When uh, you come across something like this, you're going to be seeking guidance and direction from the Attorney General's office. And this is when we're dealing with the estates. This is where we're looking at estates do not have the authority to warrant title. Our instruments talk about warranting title, uh, but you may come across situations where they're not able to warrant title. If that's the case, uh, that will probably require the parcel to be appropriated. Now, the types of warrant of titles that will cause this if you have a bankruptcy. Bankruptcies when we're dealing with trustees uh, from a, a bankruptcy estate cannot warrant title unless it's granted permission by the court. Probate estates, of course, the probate estate is required to get the permission from the other heirs and then receivership. And this is where we're looking at the receivership cannot warrant title unless it's granted by the common police court. We just have a couple of case studies here we're gonna quickly go through just to kind of keep you engaged. This particular project that we're gonna deal with is um, out of Medina County. There's the PID, Medina, Ohio. We're gonna look at James E. Jones, who's unmarried. He has a mortgage with 
um, Park National Mortgage Group, um, balance of $100,000. The FMVE is $26,000. A realty specialist preparing a parcel for negotiations. Upon the review of the title report, the realty specialist notice a mortgage on the property in the amount <clears throat> stated above. In order to assist the owner with the mortgage release, what form is used to authorize the realty specialist to obtain a mortgage release for the owner? In this case, you don't have to worry about answering. You probably guessed the answer, but we're going to provide that to you. That's going to be the RE100 form, which is used to be able to uh, give the authorization to obtain a partial mortgage release form. Here we're looking at another project out of the Defiance 15, Defiance, Ohio. We're looking at Martha Chapman and uh, Edward Chapman have a mortgage of $300,000, FMVE at $18,000. A realty specialist received an assignment to acquire the parcel listed above. Upon a review of the title report, the realty specialist verified a mortgage on the property in the amount of $300,000 with the owners. The right-of-way plans state that ODOT <clears throat> will acquire a warranty deed. In the proposed take area, a ditch will be constructed as a part of the highway project, removing a decorative retaining wall with lights. ODOT will establish the FMVE in the amount of $18,000. Should the realty specialist provide a partial mortgage release to the owner? And everybody will probably get this right. The answer is yes. And if you remember, we have to deal with the Ohio Revised Code out of 5301.61. We're looking at the controls and the removal of fixtures of improvements. If you remember, we're going to be hitting a retaining wall with lights. So automatically, we're going to have to go ahead and provide a get a partial mortgage release. In order to assist the owner with this release, with the release, what form is used to provide to the Chapmans? And that will be the RE240 partial mortgage release form. Using the same scenario <clears throat> from um, the case study six, ODOT is acquiring from Martha Chapman and Edward Chapman, husband and wife, by warranty deed. The mortgage re uh, remains at $300,000 and the FMVE is $18,000. In the proposed take area, a ditch will be constructed as a part of this highway project and the area being acquired will not have any improvements that will be taken. Should the realty specialist provide a partial mortgage release to the Chapmans? Answer is no. The mortgage release is not required when the FMVE has been established at the amount of $25,000 or less. Of course, that's in our section of 5202B, um, 06B, and under the real estate manual. We have a question that's come in. Oh, good. It says, what if the improvement is an encroachment? If the improvement is an encroachment, then basically, number one, there's no compensation to an encroachment. And the property owner or the property owner will be required to remove that particular um, improvement that's in the encroachment. Now, with that being said, is the encroachment permitted or not permitted? And that would be the other question. But as it stands, if it's an encroachment, there's no compensation, they'll be required to get the uh, item out of the existing right of way when that time comes. Okay. Case study, okay. Uh, next case study, we're dealing with Ashland 30, 15.93, parcel 12, standard highway easement and a temporary. There's our PID in Ashland, Ohio, Juanita Jackson, single person, no mortgage, $10,000 is the FMVE. The realty specialist received an assignment to acquire the parcel listed above. Upon the review of the title report, 
with Juanita Jackson, she informed you that her relative that served as a guardian had recently passed away and she is that she will need assistance with reading and understanding the information presented to her. As a realty specialist handling this parcel, what should you do? You're going to stop the presentation and explain to Juanita Jones that additional assistance will be provided to her with the assistance of the Attorney General's office. And then um, you will contact the Attorney General's office. You as a realty specialist are not equipped or trained to be able to do something of this magnitude. So therefore, in order to protect yourself, the best thing to do is to stop what you're doing and then put that call in to the district management for them to contact the Attorney General's office. All right, we're in our next knowledge check number two. Sounds great. I'm going to launch the first question. When is it apparent the owner of the property is either a minor or incompetent? Who should be contacted? AGO, supervisor, chief legal, no one. And they're voting quickly. Okay, I'm gonna close the voting down and share the responses. 86% said AGO, 9% said supervisor, and 6% said chief legal. I'm gonna hide the responses. And the answer is? It's gonna be your chief legal. Actually, the star came next to AGO. Oh, excuse me, well, AGO. Sorry, that's my fault. That's all right. Looking at the wrong screen at the Assistant Attorney General's office. All right, okay. next question. When did, um, whoops, I, I accidentally relaunched the same one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Let me put the truly next question up. <laughs> well, you know what, actually, I put that one in there twice. I'm so sorry. All right, okay. now here we go. The appraiser, review appraiser, or preparer of a value analysis for a parcel may act as a negotiator for the agency to acquire it kind of runs out there to acquire the parcel so long as the offer is ten thousand dollars or less there we go and that's true or false okay we've got enough votes close that down and share the responses um, 82% said true and 18% said false. I'm going to hide okay. the responses and you can share the answer with us. Mm -hmm. It's true. Great. I'm launching the next poll question. Employees who have an interest in a property that is impacted by an ODOT project and are not in a decision making position must, and if you wouldn't mind completing the rest of that, Wayne. Mm hmm. Um, then there's a blank line that throws across there. A, not tell anyone. B, tell a coworker. C, disclose this fact and sign a conflict of interest form. D, none of the above. Great, and they are voting. And someone actually chimed into the question pod something that I didn't know. They said that they found out that if they have the training screen in full view, they're not able to do any of the voting. They just wanted to let us know. Hmm. That's good to so know. That's good to know, yeah. All right, I'm gonna share the responses. 97% um, said disclose this fact and sign a conflict of interest form, and 3% said none of the above. Okay. I'm gonna hide that. The answer is? C. Great. Disclose. Mm -hmm. There's the next question. All right, I'm going to read this off before I launch it. When ODOT okay. is acquiring property that does not have the authority to warrant title because of an estate issue, what needs to take place for the property to be clear 
for the right of way certification. And then I'll launch the question and the answers for appropriation, more time to negotiate, a new NIAGFO, none of the above. We're getting there. We're aiming to have at least 80% of the folks vote, so. All right, I'm gonna close this out and share the responses. 85% said appropriation. New NIAGFO was 3%, none of the above was 12. So I'll hide that and you can tell us what the answer is. Okay. Is the appropriation. All right. And then the last question, mm -hmm. which of the following estates cannot support the warrant of title? Bankruptcy, probate estate, receivership, all of the above. And while folks are voting, I wanted to let the person who asked about the recordings in the box know that um, we will be uploading the recordings to our YouTube channel and I will get links out to everyone. I just ask that you give me a day or so because we actually yes. are hosting a couple of webinars a day right now and there's a, a lot that goes along with that. Okay, closing out the voting and sharing the responses. 11% said bankruptcy and 89% said all of the above. So I'll hide that. You can let us know the answer. Okay. All so right. All of the above. It's the last poll question. Okay. And I don't have anything else in the question box for you right now, Wayne. Thanks. Great. All right. Well, this concludes the uh, acquisition 102B session two. Um, thank everyone for listening, sharing, and participating. Uh, even if you have no other questions, you can still uh, send me an email and I will still be glad to answer any questions that you have. Sounds great. And thank you everyone for participating. Um, we will get certificates out to everyone. Um, I was training a new person yesterday, so if you were able to get your certificate yesterday via email for yesterday's session. That was great. Um, but those of you who were on last week, please look for those to come sometime soon as well. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Wayne, thank you so much to both yourself thank and you. Sean for doing this. It's greatly appreciated. And I thank hope everyone you. stays safe and has a great rest of their afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.